Hello, welcome everyone. Um, like I said, we're really excited for, for today's event, um, co-hosted with Ben, Blockchain Education Network, um, NUST in Ghana, and Cello. Um, so we're just, I guess I'll just do a quick introduction of, of Ben for those of us, for, for, for those of you who may know about us, who may not know about us, we're the Blockchain Education Network. Um, we're a global network of university, high school, and uh, blockchain clubs. And in 2020, we launched Ben Africa with the NAS chapter. So they're our founding chapter. Um, and we've also grown to include CrewTech. We're also going to include the University of Ghana soon. Um, so we're really excited for, for Ben Africa to have gotten so much traction and so much excitement. And we're really glad that you're all able to join us. Um, so I will pass it off to, uh, to Stello for them to introduce themselves and uh, get started on an introduction to stablecoins. Hey, hey, well, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, yeah, we're here from Cello, myself and the guy below me, Peter. Peter's over in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, just outside Lagos, and I'm uh, in New York. And we represent uh, C-Labs, which is like a core team building on Cello, which is like an open network for, um, for smart contracts, uh, stable coins, everything that's like Web3. So uh, it's pretty cool little thing we've got going on and excited to be here to talk to you about it. Um, I think I'm gonna present now just because it's easiest. Give me two seconds. Okay, can everybody see my screen all right? Yep, you are good to go. It's just loading right now. Yeah, there we go. All right, so this is a little hard. Um, let's get to intro to stable coins. So I'm sure a lot of you have uh, probably heard or learned about a stable coin in some capacity. I'm sure you've like heard it in, in conversation for if you're in uh, if you're in like Ben or you're associated with Ben, you probably have kind of gotten exposed to cryptocurrency at the very least. But something that you probably hear a lot about cryptocurrency is um, that it's super volatile and like you're gonna lose all your money. You don't don't like buy cryptocurrency because it's gonna it's gonna make you, your family, all your friends super poor. Um, and, and this is kind of inaccurate. I think that there's a lot to be said about speculation on financial assets of all kinds. And um, it could, uh, could everybody mute themselves? I got some crazy voices in my head. Um, so, so one of the things about like stable coins is like, yes, it's a cryptocurrency, but it's exactly what it sounds like for the most part. It is what it, the idea is to be stable. It's designed, it's designed to be pegged to some kind of fiat currency, which fiat is just paper dollars, which actually dollars are not made of paper, um, but this is the idea for 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 people is they want to have some kind of like res, some kind of reserve currency for them yeah, to I, be able to like I, store I, value in. Um, about to try and mute everybody, uh, mute all. That's a crazy, it's a crazy move. Um, okay, I think you guys can all still hear me. So, um, oh, where was I? Ah, yeah. So stable coins. When you try, so imagine this, you just bought yourself a bunch of Bitcoin or something, or you got paid and you have access to be able to buy a stable coin because you're like, you consider that Bitcoin is probably going to go down in price for over the next few weeks. There's been like a lot of FUD. What do you do? Do you cash it out into a bunch of like paper dollars? No, probably not. You would look around at the ecosystem and you'd be on an exchange and you'd say, oh, wow, okay, there's a stable coin and this coin is equal to $1 no matter what happens. So let me take my Bitcoin profits or whatever I'm doing and I'm going to move it over into a stable coin so that when the market crashes, I don't experience that volatility. And so that's like the base understanding of why stable coins came around. They really came around and came about because it was a group that wanted to, uh, there was just a group of people that wanted to be able to like not lose a bunch of money on the volatility of the crypto market. And the way that that's been done, I mean, like you look at money and money is a medium of exchange, it's a store of value, it's a unit uh, or a unit of a standard of value. And that, that money, like a paper dollar in a country is backed by that legal tender, the legality of that country and the, um, 
and the, to be honest, the military of that country. Um, and this is why there's been like, if you look at the United States, when the Confederates split across the country or there's been like civil wars anywhere, that, that new country has tried to make its own money because that's kind of like, it makes itself more legitimate. But what people have done with cryptocurrency is said, I don't need a country and I don't need to have some like legal book and a bunch of men in a room with gavels in order to make this be a real value to me. So what we've done with stable coins is um, make this smaller. It's hard because I got all your, all your lovely faces are covering my slides for me. Um, so cryptocurrencies that track the value of fiat currency, similar to Bitcoin, Ethereum, they are built on a blockchain allowing for fast, secure, and cheap transactions. So that's pretty much what I've just described to you. But why are stable coins important to you? Why does it matter for like what you're doing? Um, well, I can't say that it does. I don't know that it does, but I can tell you why you how you could use them. And for, for us, what we're doing at Celo is we've created what's called a programmatic stable coin. And there's an important difference here between programmatic stable coins and algorithmic uh, and um, fiat collateralized or DAO collateralized stable coins. So let me just make this smaller. Can I make this smaller? Yeah. Um, what originally happened with uh, with stable coins was that just much like much like a central bank and much like a like every bank you you interact with around the world, there was a group of people, mostly like really nerdy dudes, who were like, "Hey, let's um, pull all our resources together and let's issue out. Let's say we have together as a group we have fifteen million dollars between us. Let's put that in an account of sorts, and this account will now be the reserve that backs." 15 million stable coins that we will now mint. And so they would always have $15 million to represent the 15 million digital dollars that they had like minted or printed. And so it wasn't really, it's nothing crazy. It's literally just, we have a bunch of money and we want to represent that money on the blockchain. And so nobody touched this money that we have in a bank account. Otherwise, this whole system breaks apart. And that's called like a DAO. And you have people like MakerDAO. You have uh, you have like these groups, these uh, like fraternities of people that are maintaining these stable coins. But if there's like a flash, if there's a market crash and there's too many people that need to buy up the stable coin and there's not enough to reserve to, to back it, it actually is not stable anymore. A lot of the times it'll dip down to like 77 cents. It'll like go down to like 50 cents and suddenly it'll be flat for flash moments. But like, that's actually not stable because you're relying on a group of people and people are pretty inefficient. And they, when markets go into volatile moments, people can't be trusted to actually maintain their uh, stability. And so you have other people who are like, okay, well, we don't want to have a fiat backed. We don't want to have paper dollars in a bank account somewhere. So let me, let me find everybody I know that has Bitcoin and everybody I know that has Ethereum. And let's put all our Bitcoin and Ethereum into these like joint wallets, basically into this joint account. And we'll use that to back up these, these stable coins. And so then we'll, put, we'll have print $15 million of stable coins because we have $15 million worth of Bitcoin and Ethereum locked up. But then let's say Bitcoin and Ethereum crashes. So now you have $15 million worth of Bitcoin and Ethereum sitting in this account. But that boy just crashed. So now that's not at $15 million anymore, which means that your stable coin isn't actually stable anymore. And so you, so why I'm telling you these two kinds of types is because when you move on to what's called the algorithmic or programmatic stable coin, then you get closer to what we are doing at Celo. And the reason that we're doing this is because you can look at the way um, traditional banks expand their central reserves and they keep buying up assets. You can look at the way that people have tried to do stable coins and say, we can combine that. So what we've done is created two assets. This is the stable coin. And then here's Celo. And Celo is like the native asset that is that could go anywhere from five cents all the way up to hundreds and thousands of whatever dollars. It, the stable, the price of Celo has no like bearing to the market. The price of Celo is completely speculative. It's what people are use, like, using it for, what, what value they find in it, much like Bitcoin and Ethereum. So we took that and we have a giant central reserve of Celo and we issue a stable coin and we're minting new stable coins based off of how much is in this reserve to, to maintain that price. Now, once you have, let's say, let's say just going to keep using 15 million, our 15 million cello is in uh, this account. And let's say 
let's say cello itself is worth a dollar. So that works out really well. So 15 million cello equals 15 million CUSD, which is a stable coin. Now, let's say the price of cello shoots up to $5. Now, what's happening and what the, where the programmatic point comes in, why it's called algorithmic, is that we have a protocol and a computer that automatically starts selling its central reserve of cello. And it sells it to buy up Ethereum. It sells it to buy up Bitcoin. It's de, it's uh, diversifying this central reserve, and that's from the it, from the moment it started, it started diversifying itself. And so it's buying up Ethereum. It's buying up uh, Bitcoin, and it's doing all that because now this is the price of Celo suddenly shot up, which means that like it's over collateralized by so much, and. For those that want to know, like over collateralized means it just means like if you wanted to buy a house and that house cost $100 and the bank told you that you need to over collateralize that. So you need to put down, let's say, like $200 to $300 worth of assets. So like to, to back up that you're, this house, just like you putting down way more than is necessary. And that's what's happening when the price of Cello shoots up and you have to keep the stable coin. So we need to sell off Cello in order to maintain, otherwise the stable coin goes up to like $1.50 and that's not what people wanted. Um, I'm gonna let Richard Cordero into the room. So the interesting thing about that is as you, experience market volatility as Bitcoin crashes, as ETH crashes, as as um, cello, as cello crashes or rises, you're actually creating more opportunities to diversify this central reserve, which is the game that banks are playing. That's just the game they play. They Banks make money no matter what happens. The bank makes money when the 2008 crash comes. The bank makes money when your mom buys a house. The bank is making money. And that's the point is the house always wins. So you have to build a program and you have to build a stable like algorithm that mimics that behavior. The bank always wins. And so when you have a market crash, actually this price is a stable coin is still a dollar. People can still use that dollar however they want. But you now have a have reason and ability to like expand out this central reserve. And ours does it naturally. It does it completely automatically. If you look at the way that other stable coins have maintained over the years, you're going to look, you'll see a little bit of volatility. And some of them you'll see a ton of volatility. But if you look at the Celo blockchain and you look at how much CUSD has stabilized uh, from its inception in July of last year, it is maintained in like an exact one-to-one -one peg because this is an algorithm that's not a human being. It's not a, it's not a fraternity of dudes trying to like click their mouses to vote on something. It's just an algorithm doing its job. So um, I just wanted to explain those, those three. Is anyone using stable coins? A lot of people are using stable coins. In fact, just because of the fact that um, stable coins, uh, like non-programmatic, like the ones that are on Celo, like non-programmatic ones that are backed up by fiat currency or a DAO are actually quite volatile. There's a lot of people who even like use stable coins just to make a quick buck because they can actually, if they put a lot of money into it, they can make a little bit of money off, off the end of the day because it's so volatile. But ours, nobody can really do speculative markets on and that's kind of great. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, is this slide six? <laughs> Peter, was this you? I'm going to hand this off to my boy, Peter, Peter here. Peter's coming from Nigeria. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, that was brilliant, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm based in Nigeria, uh, a city called Accra, just uh, outside of Lagos. So, um, yeah, so are people using stable coins? So uh, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, we did some research at uh, C-Labs and we, we figured we're trying to see where how the volumes of cryptocurrencies coming from, right? And we, you know, we kind of the top the top ten countries uh, that has like uh, the highest peer to peer volumes, you know, the highest such uh, volumes of crypto uh, stable coins and all sorts of things on on Google, uh, you know, uh, about two of them are from Eastern Europe. Uh, three of them are from Africa, and I think the rest of them are from uh, Latin America, right? So it, that's, that shows a lot. And you no, know, coincidentally, those these countries are countries that have a lot of uh, high inflation rates. So in Venezuela, uh, from 2016, there was about 53, 53 million percent uh, inflation rates. You know, the currency is it's uh, at it's practically worthless at this moment, right? So uh, you know, I had some stories and some of the social programs that 
if you want to buy uh, uh, maybe a chicken or, or turkey, you, you know, they weigh, they weigh money now. They don't just, they don't count money anymore. Like you hand over a $5 bill to someone, they weigh the money. And, you know, that shows how crazy inflation is. So now, uh, and it, what, from our statistics, uh, we also figured out that these same countries are, are buying a lot into uh, stable coins. I know that shows that uh, a lot of people are trying to save their, you know, their wealth in in stable currencies, and uh, they're trying to store, you know, all the money they've worked for over the years in, you know, in stable currencies. There was a YouTube video I saw uh, I think last year about the man in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe also has had some crazy inflation rates. You know, at, at the point they had like a one trillion dollar notes, right? And you know, uh, the man was crying and. Uh, he, you know, he woke up one night and all, all the money he had saved during his uh, youthful days was just gone. Poof, that was it. You know, inflation hit and the money was literally worthless. So, and now people in these countries are trying to uh, figure out how they can move their money into more stable currencies. Now, the the the, the trick to this and uh, is that now the government in these countries are restricting people from getting their money from their local currencies into stable currencies like the US dollar, you know, Euro, France, Sterling, and the likes. And, you know, j just to avoid uh, capital flight, like just to uh, restrict a lot of money from leaving the country, right? But then people need to figure out a way to save their wealth and, and savings, right? So now the stable coins uh, are cryptocurrencies, which everyone have access to, if you have, you know, like a basic uh, internet and on a smartphone, right? So stable coins are like cryptocurrency, like Jarrell explained, they, they are stable and, you know, they allow people to move their uh, uh, money into a digital uh, form of dollar or euro, like, and they could just have it on their phone. It's quite easy. Uh, could you go to the next slide, Jarrell? Thank you. Also, another example of people using stable coins is uh, uh, the Mercy Corps uh, pilots uh, within partnership with C Labs. Uh, so this pilot took down in it went down in, in Kenya. So uh, FinHex, an initiative of Mercy Corps, you know, they organized uh, a training session where they uh, where they uh, trained about 50 Kenyan youths and they they uh, taught them how they could you know earn. Uh, sell dollars for you know for doing digital micro works like maybe translating of content uh, you know no petty jobs that uh, you could find on a uh, freelancing platform like fiverr hop work and the likes and you know they were able to hand uh sell dollars and you know convert that to uh the kenyan shilling you know within minutes and you know that's that's like revolutionary for for the gig economy in kenya right so a lot of uh, the youths in Kenya depend on on gig works, right? So they depend, they do a lot of gigs uh, on fr uh, freelancing platforms like Fiverr, Upwork, and you know it's a huge uh, source of livelihood to them. So, and in and in uh, stable coins like Solo uh, Dollars made the whole process seamless and easy for them, right? So it was easy to get this payment from. Uh, platform where they did the jobs I know. So these are like real life use cases for for uh, where stable coins are actually helping people's lives. Could you go to the next slide, Jero? Yeah, remittance. So this is a very big and interesting one, right? So um, the interesting story about myself is I got into crypto in 2016 you know, through a remittance use case. So I, I was, I used to write a lot on my Facebook profile and, you know, hire this Indonesian friend and, you know, kind of like, oh, he, he, I think it was, he was running his master's degree in, in one of the universities in Indonesia. And he, you know, he, he kind of sent me a message, like, could I write something for him? He needs it for his uh, literature studies and, you know, I wrote something and I sent it over to him and he was like, he really liked it. And I think the, the, the work I did for him was quite, it was quite very impressive. He was like, you know, I need to tip you about $20. So uh, now I was, I, I, I didn't have any idea of how I could receive money into Nigeria. So I went online, uh, I saw platforms like Western Union, MoneyGram, but the uh, $20 was too small for me to receive because the charges alone, was about $15, right? So I'll probably be getting $5. So that was that was a lot. So I, I, 
I kept on digging deep and I, and I found Bitcoin, right? And uh, my Indonesian friend sent me Bitcoin. That was how I got into, uh, into crypto. Now, uh, remittance is a very solid part of a, a lot of economies. Uh, you know, the remittance market alone is, is said to be worth around $700 billion, right? So, and a lot of economics like, you know, Nigeria, Philippines, Kenya, uh, South Africa, uh, you know, a lot of countries depend, excuse me, a lot of countries depend on remittance and getting this money from one country into another is, a, it's, it's quite difficult and it costs a lot of money now. So, uh, you know, back in the days, there used to be Western Union and MoneyGram, and their fees were quite very huge, right? So, uh, you know, now we have some fintech companies like uh, Remitly, Zoo, which their charges are quite cheaper, but it's still not as fast as it should be, right? So, you know, we're literally talking over Zoom. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of you guys here and from different countries, we are talking, having a conversation here in real time, but sending money down to to wherever you are takes a lot of effort so that shouldn't be so so now stable coins is a very effective way of of transferring value from you know across borders just the same way you would text someone on facebook and and send a what a, a message on whatsapp or send or send an email to someone and it's quite very fast so uh stable coins are like effective way of transferring this value and making sure that the person gets the exact same value that you sent so a good example of this is I had a friend in, in Canada. Uh, he was running his uh, master's degree in the British uh, University of British Columbia, and you know he, he sent me a message like, "Hey, I need some help. Could you raise me like a hundred dollars?" And I was like, "I have no idea. I can send you some money to Canada." I was like, "Although I have Bitcoin, do you know about Bitcoin?" He said, "No, he doesn't. But he, he has a Chinese friend in his class who, you know, is all into Bitcoin. So I sent him a uh, hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin." And I don't know, he did some transaction with his Chinese friend and he, he got the cash rights. So that was, that's how easy it is to send money through cryptocurrencies and, and stable coins. But now when I send the hundred dollars, he got about $95 because uh, in the process of trying to convert the, the price of Bitcoin went down and lost about $5. But stable coins allow you to send money you know, across board and ensure that whoever you're sending it to get the exact same value you're sending it to. So Valora is a perfect example of an app. Uh, it is built by, it still has it runs on the Celo network and it's powered by Celo dollars, right? So it's a perfect example of how people can send uh, money, uh, you know, an average person who doesn't really care about cryptocurrency or doesn't really know how crypto works could use Valora to, to move value and send it, you know, just to a mobile phone number and, uh, the recipient gets it uh, instantly, right? Now there's an interesting fact. It's easier to send money from, let's say, Nigeria to the USA than sending money from Nigeria to Zimbabwe. So, and you know, Nigeria and Zimbabwe are in the same in the same continents, right? Both in both Africa, and you know, it's crazy how it's it's difficult to send money within some African countries. So, uh, what we are working at Silab uh, is trying to ensure, like, our uh, Valora could let people send. Uh, money using stable coins from you know Nigeria to Zimbabwe and get it instantly, right? So these are like real life use cases of how stable coins are helping a lot of people. And you know, in South Africa alone, uh, countries like uh, Uganda, Kenya, you know, they have a lot of migrant workers in in South Africa. But sending money back home to support their families is a lot of work and costs a lot of money. So you know, people could use apps like Valora, you know using cello dollars to send money back to their families. And you know, it's cheap, it's fast, and you know, it's quite very easy. Jared, could you go to the next slide? Yeah, Impact Market. So this is a very interesting initiative as well. Uh, so Impact Market is like a, 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 an organization that is, uh, you know, they, they want to solve the poverty, uh, you know, tackle poverty in the world and, you know, so uh, the impact market is like a platform where, you know, people have access to universal basic income, right? So uh, the, the community, vulnerable communities and people who need, you know, support can come onto impact markets and, you know, create a community on the platform, you know, and create a smart contract for themselves. And, you know, a lot of things there about communities from uh, Uganda, Kenya, Brazil, um, 
I think Ecuador, I guess, and you know, a lot of people are benefiting. And the, the interesting thing is they get to receive these donations in cellar dollars, right? So, and now let me give you guys just a, a, a funny fact. So I saw a, a fact somewhere, uh, I think two days ago that the, the charity and donations industry is about three times bigger than the entire advertising industry, you know, and my mind blew off like, oof, that's a lot of money going to, you know, a lot support a lot of people. So how can we, how can we make, you know, this whole process easier and cheaper for these organizations to distribute, you know, the funds to people who need them the most. So Impact Market is a platform leveraging the cello network uh, and cello dollars to distribute, you know, uh, these donations to people who need them the most. Uh, could you go to the next slide, Jero? Yeah. Uh, is that the, so uh, yeah, so the, yeah, there's some you know, interesting statistics. So over 350 uh, uh, impact market to go runs about uh, 350. Uh, is this is that correct? Is it 350 yeah, it's about monthly month volume? Yeah, it's the monthly volume. So this is automatically paying out to all of these to, to rents now about 11,000 people every month. And this is just people with like Bitcoin or Ethereum that a donate to this, like that donate to this programmatic like distribution system, right? And so then we just automatically, it just automatically divvies it out to people. And anybody can start an impact market like group. You just have to apply. So uh, I'm trying to, in my home country of Ethiopia, I'm actually trying to get some people to apply right now because then you just become a steward of of the of the UBI and people, I mean, seventy seven cents a day is actually quite a bit, and it's what people are using to create a savings account for themselves. Nope. Was it? Thank you for your time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was it. if anybody has any like questions, um, I don't think I saw too many questions in the chat. Uh, except for how do you stable coin platforms like Celo know when to manage their circulating supply to ensure that the price of their coin remains stable? Jasmine Brunson, that's a great question. Also, I really like that you have a bunch of sound uh, equipment behind you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so that's what the, the best part about it is, is like we don't have to, um, if I understand your, correct, your question correctly, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, we don't have to do any of that. Um, so since it's programmatic, we just minted, we mint originally the origin contract is something like, I actually forget the billion, I think it's like a billion cello. And so that's just an open speculative asset for everyone in the space to speculate on. Obviously we did what we could to, you know, create a good mission and to bring in people who could build it and to could continue to take Cello like farther into the next world, to next space or next step. And we also did a lot of work to um, create like a global community, but we have no control over the price of Cello. The only thing we have control over is this central um, formula that we built that basically is just selling off Cello and buy and then buying it up when the when the stablecoin price um, dips a little bit. Um, there's an interesting secondary effect that happens from this, though, because as it's almost guaranteed in this way that like as the stable coin, because of the way it's built, as the stable coin <clears throat> is used by more and more and more people, then then the native asset cello will go up in price because circulation is equals to like people being like, wow, that's being used a lot. So this is network is valuable. So let me buy up Cello. And so the price of Cello goes up, which is cool, but it also um, means that we can create um, essentially um, a savings account for people and they can get interest on there when they're holding the stable coin in their uh, wallet and like that Valora app that we just showed you, they can actually gain interest on that, which is actually more wealth, more like, it's more diversified and like uh, uh, barriers of access re like reduced to wealth, wealth growth, wealth accumulation than really anything else. Like you can open up a bank and you can get like 0.1% back after 15 years, sure. But you also actually have to have a decent amount of money to do all of that. And then in a, in a foreign country, like in the global South in some areas, like you can try and get an interest account going, but then like, Peter was saying in Zimbabwe, okay, I got five percent interest on a diff on an asset that's just going down and going down in value every second. So what does that really do for me? 
So this is a way to kind of get around that. And that's why we wanted to build in like, yes, this is a programmatic stable coin. And so since we're getting like a lot of traction and the price of solo is going up, there's no reason why we can't like also build in this ability to create like interest for people who are holding and using uh, state the stable coin because it's just beneficial for the whole ecosystem. The more people that use the stable coin, the more the value of solo goes up. So we, why wouldn't we do that? Does that kind of ask your answer your question? It, yeah, it completely answers my question for sure. So um, mm -hmm. if I could like add, add to that, um, mm -hmm. I was just thinking like with Bitcoin, it, you know, it's already proving to be a store value and whatnot, mm -hmm. but um, questions like were um, arising about the fact that it doesn't really like, um, it's not really like a really good uh, unit of account. So with that being said, like mm -hmm. uh, with stable coins, I think that it being like a, a currency where you can actually have it as a unit account and, you know, back it by your, like with your business and stuff like that. I think with people um, who are skeptical about the volatility of Bitcoin, uh, like just introducing them to stable coins make them like feel more confident in it. So uh, definitely like, like this a lot. Um, and me personally, like I always would hear, like hear about Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. But mm -hmm. like the idea yeah. of like tether and, and die and sell like cello and stuff like that. I think like for the newbies, they definitely need to know about this. So yeah, I appreciate that. And it's like it's interesting because Bitcoin is um Bitcoin to me is it's great, it's awesome. But at the same time, it is a very like unapproachable asset to, at this point for a lot of people, just like in fees alone and in the general like price and the way that people like utilize it isn't really for like everyone but if you listen to everyone who was building bitcoin or ethereum a few years ago all they would say over and over again is this is how we're going to bank the unbanked we're going to bank the unbanked guys and it's like in what way and like if you think that you're going to bank the unbanked with something that costs five like five to you know anywhere between five to 150 dollars in order to do a transaction just alone that's not actually something that's approachable for everyone so i think stable coins really like you're saying jasmine uh provide that opportunity for people to just say okay my assets are in cash and my cash is going down in value. What can I do to offset that? And what can I even do to bring in cash or to bring in digital dollars instead of bringing in cash, which is something that um, a lot of people, a lot of people are interested in. Ooh, okay. We got some new questions. Which consensus mechanism does sale of stable coin use? Oh, it's a uh, proof of stake or proof of stake uh, mechanism. And we're, uh, you know, always pushing to keep diversifying. If anybody knows anybody who wants to be a validator, feel free to apply to our validator program through the community fund. Um, and what differentiates DAI stablecoin from Celo stablecoin? The DAI stablecoin is maintained by essentially a, a, a fraternity of mostly men. Uh, and it's just a fraternity of guys that are like essentially voting and keeping these assets locked up and co over collateralized and bonded. But at any point, like a LP, a, a person who's holding a lot can just like, they could exit and cause some like market volatility. I don't know if any of you have ever seen like the whales dump, like when a new coin is introduced and there's a whale dump, like those types of vulnerabilities exist inside of uh, DAOs. Um, and so it's a great, a great question. And it, it's called a like a, like a liquidity drain is another term for it. Um, if you're having issues, raise your hand and send an emoji in the chat and we can unmute you. All right, yeah. Anyone want to do some live questions, some back and forth? There's a, sorry, there's a question here from Thomas Badu. It says, uh, how stable is CUSD? Would the price always remain at, at par with USD? If yes, why is the price below a dollar? Like right now? Um, uh, I think he's asking about like right now. So like the say the price is always going to, it's going to be a range dollar probably right now you're looking at it's like 99.99 or something like that. But it's just like, every, I think it's like every time the blocks are synced up, it's, it just readjusts the, the central protocol to, to sell off or, or buy up solo. And so, um, and yeah, the price will always be on par with the United States dollar, but that's not to say that we're only releasing, um, USD or CUSD, we in like a month at the end of this month, because, you know, the United States dollar actually doesn't run the world, um, we'll be releasing uh, the C euro. And so like, then we have the C euro and that can be, you know, utilized, people get paid in C euro. And it's something that's, that is using the same, um, same programmatic, like stable mechanism to maintain the value of like 
however many C euros are needed and need to be minted. So yeah, could you please develop on the legal issues that theater stable coin is going through right now? Oh, the stable coin is going through right now. How do you mean, uh, Felician, could you, could you refine that question? I'm not sure I understand you. Uh, she may be talking about uh, Tether. Yeah, sure. So, uh, can you hear me? Oh, oh Tether. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm 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 a little bit curious about like all the legal issues uh, the Tether um, stable coin is going through right now. Um, you know, I'm, I, can you touch a little bit on that? Um, I don't really like to speak on the legal issues of other of like other projects um, or teams, but. Uh, if people are, you know, doing remittances and creating um, cross-border payments for stuff that's like illegal, then they can have issues. So it's interesting is if you actually look at the amount of oil that can be shipped between like certain countries or across borders, there's actually a daily limit to how much oil can be paid for and shipped between two borders. And an interesting use of stable coins that people have done is like, for instance, Tether or Tezos. Um, they could like get paid in the books for this much oil, right? But they're gonna ship double that and they're gonna get paid for this much oil in cash and then they're gonna get paid the rest in a stable coin, right? So if anybody's doing something like that, that can be like highly illegal to like actual inter international trade. But I don't know too much about the, specifically the tether legality issues, but um, I, so I don't, I don't wanna speak to another team's legal stuff. Um, if you, do, do, if you receive CUSD, what can you buy with it in an African country? How would someone in an African country liquidate the CUSD? Like buying things, or do people see CUSD as a hedge to depreciation? Both, all of the above. Um, I'll get into the depreciation thing. Peter, I know that you've done work with people on the ground for creating like cash in, cash outs. So I'll let you answer that question. But for the depreciation asset, asset question, it's um, pretty interesting because when we started with like our pilots, the impact market pilot that you saw, right? Like that's just like 11,000 people around the world getting 77 cents a day. And when we started, we were like, wow, we really need to make sure that they have abilities to cash out. So we made sure to find in like, we made sure to find vendors that we would interact with directly and provide them cash for these people that were going to start buying with, uh, with Cello at their stores, right? And we saw, first of all, like, a few addresses every single day going and buying stuff in the store. And so after a while, um, you saw, we, we changed the stores and we said, hey, now we want you to take payment in CUSD on, the, on your phone as well. So they're just scanning each other's QR codes and paying each other. And he's like, if you do that, we can make people's money go farther and we'll actually incentivize it for them just to keep the money in app. And we did that. Then you saw a bunch more people come in because they wanted to keep their money in app. And what ended up happening was like moms were buying like uh, diapers and like milks and like all this nutrients and stuff they needed for their kids because their money went farther at these specific shops. Um, and so then you saw people, the next step was like not even caring about cashing out because they wanted to continue to once like to continue to accrue like interest on their stable coin assets. And um, that's kind of I think a really beautiful thing because it's just essentially like making a bank account without making a bank account. And that's something that just like actually fulfills the bank and the unbanked promise, which is, which is something that I'm a little bit annoyed at everybody for giving up on. Um, so yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah. Thanks Gerald for answering. I'm kind of curious about uh, what you were saying there. Like, so you incentivize people to keep money in app and like um, elongate uh, like the money, um, the, the flow mm -hmm. at least. But how would you convince like a mom to buy like food and like diapers and stuff? Is it is it because the person accepting it is they're also accepting CUSD? Mm -hmm. They're incentivized to? Yeah. So that was part of our experiments. It's like we would just like create this incentive for the actual vendor at the at the like the endpoint vendor, right? And say, hey, like if you take the payments in CUSD, here's like the cash transfers that we'll do to like make sure that this maintains to see like how this experiment plays out, right? And since the vendor was willing to essentially accept one dollar equals a dollar ten, you know, dollar fifty to him, sure. it's like okay, yeah. cool. And so then you have a ton of people coming and not even trying to cash out anymore. They're just trying to work inside of the inside of the app and use the app. 
Nice, because the vendor is sort of taking a little bit of a, the vendor is taking a little bit of a risk, but he's like receiving an incentive to take that risk. Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah. that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There'd be an app that can, yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, so we have, uh, we have uh, uh, an alliance partner called uh, Payagents and it's like a, a payments processor that lets you, uh, you know, make payments on merchants platforms, on e-commerce platforms, and you basically can use your cello uh, dollars to make payments for, you know, to purchase computers, foods, and all other stuff. And uh, just to add to the last question, do people see CUSD as an hedge to depreciation? So I think solo dollars means different things to different people in different countries. Uh, you know, in countries with uh, high inflation rates, yeah, they definitely see it as an hedge to protect their you know, wealth from inflation and currency depreciation. And for other countries, it's more of, you know, a, a faster, means of payment to send payments out of the country and also receive payments out of the country. And, you know, and for other uh, countries, it's, it means dif different things, right? So in Nigeria and, you know, Nigeria's high inflation rate, so a lot of people are using cellular dollars to, to save money. And in countries like um, South Africa, you know, people are using cellular dollars to, you know, make payments. So cellular dollars means different things to different people. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so this next one is actually really interesting. Um, I do not know how to pronounce your name, but I appreciate, will there be an app that can, that cello can be used to buy stuff like computers, foods, et cetera. Actually already, if you, um, and this isn't obviously apply everywhere in the world. So we're aware of that, but we're trying to, and we're trying to get local vendors on the ground, um, to take this, uh, and figure out like really who, uh, has gift cards. So inside of Valor right now, depending on where you are, you could actually like use the cello that you receive cross-border remittances, cross-border payments. Maybe you're just liquidating some Bitcoin, whatever you're doing, right? You can use in that to buy gift cards to like Amazon or just various types of like big chain type uh, vendors. And we're doing everything we can more and more to find more vendors who have like gift cards that we can just automatically like buy out and switch out. So at the very least, if you're in a place where you can't cash in or you can't go to a vendor and get cash for your cello, or you can't find an exchange in your, in that's, that's working inside of your border, um, that allows you to, you know, cash out into whether it's the Naira, the Bira or whatever, like, um, you can at the very least use your cello to buy a, like coupon code that means that you know it's worth like fifty dollars at Amazon, fifty dollars at like um, the Apple Store, whatever people are watching like buy at. So when you talk about computers and stuff like that, I, I mean you can get a computer shipped from from the internet to anywhere in the world for the most part, thank God. Um, but it might take a while, but at least you could buy it, and that's what's that's that's kind of the end goal, isn't it? Share value. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, cool. The question is, say, uh, how long does it take to receive money in Africa to get without using cello dollars or whatever? So uh, <sighs> I think it depends on the channel, but true banking channels, right, takes a lot of time. Uh, I think South Africa is one of the most developed, uh, you know, systems in Africa. And so, uh, you know, one of my South African buddies told me it takes about three days to receive money from, you know, into your bank accounts if you're receiving from outside of the country and i think that's that's quite a lot and i, I think uh, at the moment we have uh, you know fintech uh, platforms like uh, remitly azimo uh, transferwise and a lot of stuff and i, I think they, they they work differently but i think it's a lot faster now it takes about maybe an hour to about two days so uh, and which I think is still quite slow, right? So you should be able to receive your money instantly. So um, you gotta tell them, get tell them how better. fast it is. <laughs> Come on, yeah, stop so, building up to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for solid dollars, it's it's almost instant. It's not not almost. It's instant, right? So um, and that's how it should be. You know, uh, if you can send a text to someone in Turkey uh, within seconds, you should be able to send money to the same place within seconds as well. And more important, yeah, and on top of that, just to add to that, 
let's say that person in Turkey doesn't actually have the Valora app, like which is the, the Valora app, by the way, is just a mobile app that represents the, the native wallet of the Celo blockchain. So it's nothing like, it's not really an app app. It's like, this is an open source code turned into a, a, a mobile app. Um, and if somebody in Turkey doesn't have that app downloaded, just text them the amount like it'll just you can just say like yeah i want to send this person this much money and they it'll you type in their phone number into the app and it just sends them a text with the link to download the app and the second that they download that app their money's already in their account because it's tied to their phone number so it's like encryptedly mapped to a phone number and so anyone's phone number is essentially their bank account if they want to if they want to use the mobile version of Valora of of the cello blockchain wallet which is called Valora. So it's pretty instant and it's pretty accessible. It's kind of crazy because like you can't send someone money on PayPal or money on Venmo without them having a Venmo account or a PayPal account. And I think it's a, it's a, a greater in like innovation that people really take, like give it credit for. Is Valora what you would recommend, uh, you know, the, the students and attendees here use to interact with Celo dollars or is there another yeah. like, third party wallet? It's super easy. Yeah, you can use Valora um, to interact. You can also, like, it, I, it's the easiest one. It's, it looks exactly like Venmo, like you saw those pictures, and you, it's just very comfortable and, and familiar. Um, if you want to use a browser, a browser wallet, we have one that's made. It's been made by DSRV Labs. You can find it in, like, the Google Chrome or the Google Web Store. Um, that one is in beta. It's It'll be, like, out of beta by... I think the end of the month, but um, yeah, Valora is like tried and true tested and it's something that thousands and thousands of people around the world are using. Um, quick question. So about just, I'm, and I'm, I apologize if you've already gone over this, but sending money directly to phone numbers, what um, is the KYC process behind that? Is there just like a one-time password that the user has to use to authenticate themselves? Mm. Um, Cause I know over here, right, in, I'm, I'm in Canada. Okay. Everyone wants to, you know, connect to a lot of these exchanges and, you know, they ask for a passport or some sort of ID, but, you know, IDs vary across, you know, various African countries. And so not everyone has one. So what's the, what's the KYC yeah. for you guys? Yeah, for us, it's uh, if you have a phone number, you can have a bank account. And the way that we ver verify that that's your phone number is like the same way you make a wallet for any other blockchain. Uh, you'll obviously have a seed phrase um, and it's like your private key but your phone number is actually just mapped to a public address. It's not mapped to a private key. So someone can't like steal your phone or steal your SIM card and then like steal your money. Um, but what you end up doing to um, validate that this person owns that cell phone is like they get a, a, a series of uh, validation text messages being automatically sent to them from the validators that are actually maintaining all of the network transactions. Um, and so this automatic process like goes through and then they validate that they are this cell phone number. Um, the way we see it, it's just because someone doesn't have a formal ID doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to have access to money or wealth accumulation. Um, and it's kind of pertinent because there's an incredible amount of people around the world that are just like denied access to bank accounts purely because of like their gender or their caste or, or, you know, just pre-existing situations. So even though those people aren't allowed to have bank accounts, it's interesting that the world kind of like slyly let them all get phone, num phone numbers and cell phones. And so we're like, all right, there's a hack, let's work around it. Hey, I, I put a question in the chat. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to ask uh, just a geared question. So um, yeah. did like, the Central Bank of Nigeria's uh, band affect you guys at all? Peter, you wanna? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the very good question. Peter's on the ground in Nigeria right now. <laughs> Pretty sure he's paid multiple people in solo in the last few weeks. Yeah, so, uh, well, yeah, it did in a way because uh, we were trying to build, uh, we're trying to work with partners to build a uh, cash in and cash out uh, network. So a lot of people can get the cash into seller dollars and get the cash from seller dollars uh, and get move parts of seller dollars into local currencies, right? So uh, the band stopped, you know, uh, a lot of partners we were trying to work with and there was kind of like a, a slow uh, progress in that uh, ball. Now we have other partners that are working with to, you know, use a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, system to process our, you know, the cash in and cash out. Uh, an example of that is Beatmama, and you know, we tested 
uh, sell all us cash in and cash out live on the platform about three days ago, and it worked perfectly well. So it, it did it did uh, affect us, but you know we are figuring out a way to move forward. Yeah. Um, quick question for you guys. So so Gerald, you were saying earlier, so people could like get the cello dollars and then they could like use it like on Amazon to buy product. So, mm -hmm. so it's essentially not touching uh, the Nigerian, like, like, the, like the, 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 the regular currency at all. Yeah. That's insane. That's yeah. like mind blowing, right? Like, holy shit. Yeah. And the second that, I mean, the way I see it and I'm pushing pretty hard is like Nigerians are always consistently and have been since 2015, like ninth, anywhere from ninth to like sixth uh, greatest Bitcoin and cryptocurrency transaction volume per day. So there's nothing eventually stopping us and the community from proposing like the stable Naira, like C Naira on, on, on Celo Network. And then it's like interacting in a currency that they know, but still never touching the Nigerian like government in any way. Mm, cool. Yeah, um, I'm curious how many of you have ever like, you know, tested out uh, cryptocurrency payments of any kind. I get the feeling Jasmine has. I get the yeah, feeling Satya sure. has. For sure, for sure. Eric. Yeah, how much How much was your fees on that? If I can be quite honest, that's why I stopped using Coinbase. I had to get yeah. off. But um, now since I've like, you know, kind of like moved uh, to like Binance and other exchanges, it's not, it's not that bad. But like at the end of the day, um, I try to huddle. So I keep, you know, yeah. the hard wallet on me, you know, so. Yeah, but it, it, the uh, uh, the fees are sometimes crazy, and I get it. When you're using, you can't like expect like decentralized finance from a centralized like exchange. But I'm pretty sure you're gonna tell me that uh, Solo's uh, fees are like low as hell. Yeah, that's just the answer. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, we uh, we're experiencing like you want to send uh, one hundred and fifty dollars, three hundred dollars. You're looking at uh, anywhere from one one hundred or uh, one tenth of one tenth to three tenths of a penny um and in some cases even lower um so that's something else like i don't know you, i know you guys have probably all seen the nft craze and like what it means to be an artist yeah there he is thank you peter um and what it means to be an artist in today's world like trying to be getting make it on the digital scene i think the artists that got really excited about making nfts and minted nfts got hit with reality pretty quick they were like oh it's going to cost me 60 to 160 bucks to like even mint this thing and then i have no guarantee anybody's going to buy my art obviously like i've never had any guarantee anyone's going to buy my art so what am i even doing here is the question a lot of artists are asking themselves and so when you have networks like ours which is essentially the same as ethereum just built for mobile first infrastructure and it's like still evm compatible it's if everything's the same um except for it's essentially being built to scale with the uh, with the the minds and the wallets of like the disenfranchised or um like the less access people so what we have here is like another network where people can start minting nfts and it costs them a penny and they can make actual profit so um it's really kind of mind blowing that every, I, I understand there's a lot to be had about like a meme culture and like a, a fun fraternity that everyone's a part of, but at this point people are just losing money. So but when you say it costs pennies, are you talking about the gas fees to like mint the, okay. Wow. Yeah. And it wow. costs pennies like, and you can even pay gas in multiple currencies. You can pay it in a stable coin, you can pay it in cello, or you can pay it in GUE, like, mm -hmm. so yeah. Chillas and Bitmax, nice. Um, yeah, any other any other questions? I'm trying to think of other cool things that we're doing. There's a lot of them. Though that impact market thing, right? So that's a programmatic, pro this is my favorite part of this actually. Yes, obviously I'm super into UBIs. I'm super into like poor people not being forced into like extended poverty because they just like can't get access to funds. So that's awesome. But I think at some point there's also this desire to create like actual work for people. And the UBI, uh, the UBI guys over at Impact Market have now created and are trying out, testing out in certain regions, but about to deploy um, more broadly around the world 
this like plastics micro work program where people in these like third world countries like can just start picking up all their trash and accumulating it and they're working with recycling vendors to like validate that these these are the addresses that are like dumping this the the recycling this trash but once again remember the, the universal basic income is being is like donation based right people are donating to this just grand wallet right so now, when that starts happening, I think they did something, they did like a ridiculous, in the pilot, they did like a ridiculous amount of trash. It's like multiple tons of trash that they picked up in like a weekend um, because they were getting paid to. But now that that's a part of it, whenever people are donating to the UBI, they can now, from a corporate perspective in the West, claim carbon tax credits. So you're actually creating an incentive on both sides. Like there's nothing to stop people from starting to work together because the haves and the have nots need the same end, they, have, they need the same ending. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. Um, I know like Jack Dorsey is super involved with, with Cello and like super pro Africa. Um, yeah, so how's that like coming along and, and um, yeah, curious. Yeah, um, Dorsey's been a strong supporter from the beginning, as well as like, um, yeah, just a lot of people. Um, and I think the biggest push for them is like, yeah, they love to see the magic of Bitcoin and they loved what it did for society as a whole. But in the end, I think there's only like 10 million Bitcoin wallet addresses that exist. And it's like, there's billions of people. And so Dorsey being a t Twitter like founder and many of these other people being Silicon Valley types, um, they know like they went through the whole phase of like, oh, we got to start building for mobile. We have to start building for mobile. And they did that five, six, seven years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And for some reason, this Web3 world, this blockchain world hasn't quite put that together. And so you're looking at these visionaries like getting behind Cello because they're like, oh, you guys actually built it for cell phones. It's interesting because there's 5.6 billion cell phone users on the planet. And that's, but that's, that's what we're looking for, you know, in the end. Cool. I just wanted to point out. Sure. Oh, go ahead. So. Go ahead, Jessica. Yeah, I just wanted to point out, I think that's really awesome just to have that um, with the cell phones because like uh, in America, about like 11% of Americans don't even have like, uh, I would say consistent internet usage, but just about everybody like has a cell phone. So it's just like, I just think that's like genius. I, I don't really hear about companies um, just saying like, okay, as soon as you have a like, as soon as you have like um, just this one device, you can have a, like a bank account instant, instantly. And you don't have to worry about um, people kind of like discriminating you against like different types of uh, heuristics and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to just point that out. I'm definitely gonna look into uh, Cello more. Yeah, and if anybody here likes to build, I don't know if any of y'all are developers or anything or designers and things, we have like a, big old hackathon happening right now with a big, big old purse. And it's like 60K right now with the first prize of 10,000. Um, so I would look into it. I know where everyone's coming from around the world. There's even like specific prizes for where you're coming from in the world, like top Africa, 2000, top Asia, $2,000, top uh, Latin America. Um, and it's just like a way to dip your toes and see what people are building. But really, we're trying to like energize people around exactly that, Jasmine, like this uh, idea that, hey, we built this for cell phones, which means we built it for everybody. So ask yourself, who's everybody and start building for those people. Well, Peter, Jarrell, we would love to have you guys join the Ben Africa Telegram chat as well. Um, I just dropped the link again uh, in the in the Zoom link. So if anyone wants to join our group and keep asking questions, continue the discussions, that would be one of the best ways to do so because we'd be doing that all the time. Yeah, and feel free to join our Discord. It's chat.cello.org. Um, I already DM'd it to some of you because y'all are just like asking such good questions. Um, <laughs> so. so someone's also asking if uh, you could post a link to the hackathon too. Yes, I can. Can I do like a shameless self-promotion for, for Twitter as well? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> um, make a mobile hackathon. This is us. This is the hackathon. Then follow Cello Org on Twitter, at Cello Org. And then myself is at Tech. All right, awesome. Thank you. Thanks to both of you, to Gerald and Peter, and also for Cello for partnering with us. Thank you to, uh, to Nust for co-hosting and helping us organize and um, get students involved with this. 
really, really great presentation. I know, you know, coming into this, knowing a fair amount of uh, on stable coins, I definitely learned a lot. Um, and also from the students and from you guys, you know, really great questions. Was really impressed with the questions asked. Definitely learned a lot. I'm really happy that we left all that time for questions. Um, and thanks for staying on, you know, a little bit after after 12 and for the students as well, again, for all your questions and we can continue the discussion on the, um, the Ben Telegram channel. That's also where we um, let everyone know about upcoming events. We also take suggestions, you know, for this event, it was the NUS students who said we really want, you know, to do something on stable coins. And so we got in contact with, uh, with Cello and uh, we all made it happen. So we're here to kind of provide education not that we think is necessary, but what, you know, that the students come to us and tell, you know, and let us know that they would like to, to learn more about. So, yeah, thank you. Thank every, thanks everyone again for, uh, for taking this time on your Saturday. I don't know what time I'm sure everyone's, you know, across different time zones, but um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you to Gerald and Peter and Cello for hosting this. Thank you to Nest and um, yeah, we'll continue the conversation on, uh, on Telegram. And we'll leave the chat, we'll leave the Zoom call running for a few minutes so people have time to click on the links because once the call ends, those links will be gone. Yeah. And we'll post them again in the Telegram chat as well. Yeah. Thank you for having us. This has been super awesome. Your questions, your questions are genuinely very good, all of you, and better than a lot of panels and stuff I've been on with actual seasoned <laughs> professionals asking questions. <laughs> Um, they're just yeah. asking when's the price going up when when's Cello yeah, going to the pretty moon much. <laughs> yeah they're like how much money did you have when you got when you raised like it's more like ridiculous questions yeah oh, hey norbert hey kids how are you good norbert's uh yeah. from nest oh, nice. yeah and so I'll, I'll just like to thank um james and the entire team from cello for giving some one of the in-depth lectures we've had so far in our journey as a blockchain society and we are very grateful i think we've asked a lot of um very good questions and you you guys have been able to explain to us how Celo is developing this kind of stable coin and how um countries like um ghana nigeria and other countries in africa need stable coins we are very grateful for that thanks guys and we hope to host you in yeah. more times to come <laughs>